This program contains scenes that have been dramatized, with special attention given to historical accuracy. In today's digital age, software is secure. Cheaters can't beat the programs, unless the cheater is the one who wrote the program. There's a lot of ways to attack and to try to compromise these machines. This is the story of Ron Harris, a brilliant insider. A computer expert paid to catch gambling crooks. This was far and above anything we normally dealt with. He became gambling's most shocking wild card. He's the most notorious cheat of all time. I think it was crazy like a fox. I think it was brilliant. Ron turned the machines into his own personal ATM. Everything went just kind of how I'd hoped it would go. When you're breaking the house, everything's got to be perfect. Your plan... Showtime. Your partner... Okay, John. I hope to God you can hear me. Your equipment... Here we go. 12, 19, 27, 33, 17, 64, 37. Your execution. 12. I'm on it. I'm getting it. 22. 26. Otherwise, when you win the prize. Oh, yeah! That's it, baby! King of Tina! Oh, my God. The house might break you. You need to speak to Mandarin. Las Vegas, 1989. The beginning of the most extraordinary growth spurt in Sin City history. In the decade to come, massive themed hotels will rise from the desert. Casino floors will reach almost 200,000 square feet. The beautiful fountains, the 5,000 room hotels, the Cirque du Soleil's all up and down the strip. It's a hook to get people to come here, and then once they get here, they start gambling. What fills these huge gambling temples? Slot machines. 86,000 slots pack the casinos. Coin by coin, gamblers feed $37 billion into the slots in 1989. Slots get a lot of floor space in casinos because they're really the most profitable game, and they're a lot less volatile than table games. Once blackjack, roulette, and craps were the principal earners. Now, the slot machine is king. Standing guard over this powerful slot kingdom is a computer whiz named Ron Harris. I was always looking at ways on these machines that they could be cheated um, and what could be done to prevent that. For the rough and tumble world of Las Vegas gambling, Harris is an unlikely enforcer. You know, some people are very attracted by the gaming and the glitter and the glamour of the downtown, but, you know, I, I grew up with it. To me, it was just a activity going on next door. What fascinates Harris is electronics. Ever since I was a little kid, I was wiring things together. If I could find something electronic and, like, take it apart, try and figure out how it worked. How could I change it and make it work different? By his late 20s, Harris has blossomed into a full-fledged computer programmer. Most people don't understand programming. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, it's difficult. But it's beautiful. The 27-year-old joins the Nevada Gaming Control Board, the agency charged with keeping all the gambling in Nevada on the up and up. They are responsible for, for many things, including the, the arbitration of disputes between uh, patrons and the casinos, stealing, cheating, that, that type of thing. Anything where they needed expertise in the area of computers or electronics and that, I was their expert. The Gaming Control Board desperately needs computer experts like Ron Harris 
because slot machine technology is rapidly advancing. Invented in 1899 by San Francisco mechanic Charles Fay, the slot machine was an instant success. A clockwork gambling machine of gears and pulleys that offered high proportion payouts and let gamblers play at their own pace. Slot machines have been so popular because they're really easy to play and there's no skill involved and there's no intimidation factor. By the 1960s, electronic features appear in slot machines and by the early 1980s, the gears and pulleys vanish forever. Inside the new slot machine, a tiny silicone chip spins the reels. The reels are driven by small stepper motors that are instructed on where to move the reels uh, by a small microprocessor device, which is really just a small computer. It's the new high-tech Vegas. The casinos love it because precise house odds can be programmed right into the machine. Players love it because the winnings are no longer limited to the contents of the machine. A single quarter might win thousands of dollars. The only Vegas player who's not crazy about the new machines is the gaming control board. The board um, was not very savvy when it came to computerized slot machines. That's a real problem because it's the control board's job to stop casinos from rigging the machines and to stop players from cheating. That's why the board needs Ron Harris. Whenever there was a slot uh, cheating case, they went to Ron. I was a top expert at figuring out how gaming devices could be what they call subverted. There's very few people on the planet that really look uh, that closely at, at slot machines. Ron Harris gets his first major test. The gaming control board receives a tip from an unnamed informant that a certain type of video poker machine is rigged to pay fewer jackpots. The games are made and distributed by a Vegas-based company, American Coin Enterprises. American Coin and put those out in some of the uh, local pubs uh, on a participation basis, which means that, that they share in the revenue uh, with the bar owners. Since American Coin takes a cut of the profits, the company stands to gain if the machines are withholding jackpots. It's up to Harris to find out if the company's cheating and how. Players would always say, oh, I was playing this machine and it never even hit uh, jacks or better. Harris launches a search for what Vegas insiders call a gaff, a set of crooked commands written right into the software. Before the computer revolution, corrupt casinos could rig the old mechanical slot machines to dodge the high-paying combinations. Likewise, players could cheat the old machines with retrievable coins, wires, or magnets. But a gaff in a digital machine is much more effective. Instead of meddling with the machine's guts, a gaff meddles with its brain. Uh, this board essentially drives the reels and, and shows the player the outcome. Uh, the microprocessor chip uh, executes the code that is contained in these two uh, EEPROM devices. And this is what a slot cheat would be looking to change to give them a distinct advantage over the gaming device. If there's a gaff to be found in the American coin case, Ron Harris will find it. We went to um, a bar where supposedly the chips had been changed. We took these chips back to the laboratory, did some analysis. The only way to find a gaff is to take the suspect chip off the main circuit board and comb through its program, line by line, comparing it to a master copy submitted to the control board by the manufacturer. Ron worked like a dog on that case. Ron worked very hard through the American coin case. At last, the late nights pay off. Ron Harris finds the hidden gaff. The machine would only hit royal flushes half as often as it was supposed to. You were supposed to get a jackpot, but the last card would change at the last moment and the jackpot would be blocked. It was the first time we'd found something specifically like that. Now Harris has proof of the crime. A chip altered by someone to command the slot machine to pay off less than it's supposed to. The real question is, who's the criminal? 
Could it be someone at American Coin, the company that manufactured and distributed the machines? Hoping for a friend on the inside, Harris approaches American Coin's head programmer, Larry Volk. Well, we didn't understand a lot of the complexities of how it works, so we went to Larry Volk. He's the one who would understand them best. So he called me back and said, well, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and discuss that code with you, but I need to check with my wife. It seemed very odd that he would have to check with his wife before he would discuss how code worked in a machine. Harris knows Larry Volk is hiding something. But what? And why? Larry Volk was um, a very uh, scared individual. He was intimidated by the owners of American Coin. He feared them. He didn't want to give up the secret. Ron Harris persists, hoping to break the case and get specific evidence. We met and talked to him, and at that point he basically confessed that he had uh, rigged the machines. Larry Volk admits to gaffing at least 500 American coin slot machines in 93 different locations in and around Las Vegas. What he said and what I believe is that it was the owners of the company that told him to do this. When the American coin story breaks, it's a colossal scandal. They were able to block from 12 million to 17 million dollars worth of Royal Flush and other jackpots over a three year period. But Ron Harris's efforts come at a cost. Larry Volk's confession brings Volk nothing but trouble. He was the key witness in that particular uh, case. I'm sure that put a lot of pressure on him, made him very uncomfortable. Well, we knew there was a, it was a serious situation. He received threatening phone calls, and his wife said that he was very afraid of what might happen and was concerned that somebody associated with American Coin might be trying to intimidate him. What happens next will have far-reaching implications for the entire Nevada gambling world. And for Ron Harris. Spring 1990. One of the biggest cheating scandals in Las Vegas history has the Neon City transfixed. American Coin Enterprises, a slot machine manufacturer, stands accused of rigging the computer chips in its own machines to cancel jackpots. This is one of the major cases in the history of uh, Nevada gaming control. It was a big black eye in the industry. It was a, it was a black eye for the gaming control board at the time. Computer expert Ron Harris is on the case. He's figured out that American Coin forced its own programmer, Larry Volk, to alter the chips inside the machines. Now, Harris has persuaded Volk to testify against American Coin. A major victory. Larry had knowledge that the owners of the company knew that the machines were rigged. It was very difficult for Larry Volk, and uh, he worried for his safety. He was afraid of uh, what might happen to him. I'd heard that Larry Volk had been shot and killed in his driveway. Mr. Volk was, was murdered. It was because he was probably the, the key witness in that particular uh, case. Ron was very upset that Larry had been killed. Dead. Over what? A video poker game? What sense does that make? He felt uh, uh, maybe somewhat responsible. Somebody I was working with, a witness on a case, is executed in his driveway. It was uh, traumatic. Without Larry Volk to testify, the American coin cheating case dies, adding to Harris's trauma. They did get away with it. He felt a little disgusted that the perpetrators of this crime were never prosecuted. So, uh, something went off inside his head. That was maybe the first seed that started him in the direction he went. It's hard for me to say what did it. I was under a lot of stress, having a lot of problems. Ron Harris has decided to cheat the machines himself. 
he saw how American coin had done it. How he does it will go down as one of the most brilliant schemes in Las Vegas history. It is absolutely a genius move, as sinister as it is. Ron Harris isn't the only one affected by the Larry Volk case. It affected the whole gaming board. And uh, this major case sort of blew up in their face. The Gaming Control Board changes how they police slot machines. They devise a plan to ensure that slot machines have not been gaffed once they've been installed. The Gaming Control Board puts Ron Harris in charge of the program. Hey, Ron, is the system ready? Yeah, sure, it's all set. I'm the one that actually built the equipment that they used for testing the chips in the slot machines. Hi, John. How Hi. are you? Agents would go on surprise inspections to various casinos. Oh, that one there in the middle looks like a lucky one. Okay. Well, they would go and they'd uh, plug the laptop computer into the back of a machine. Pull out the circuit boards, remove the EEPROM device that contained the software, and start assessing the program to make sure that the program was the one that the gaming board had approved. If the chip's code doesn't match the official master copy on file, the gaming control board knows the machine has been compromised. Any machine that didn't contain approved software would be shut down. What the board doesn't know is that its superstar digital expert has turned against them. I had modified the program in that equipment so that it would actually cause a chip to be rigged when they were testing it. And what he did was have these people who are trying to assess the fairness of machines actually create cheating devices within the machines. And it was the equipment they were using to test the machines with that was rigging the machines. Over the next six months, the field agents unknowingly corrupt a dozen more slots. It was crazy like a fox. It was brilliant. He was supposed to be the guy that was overseeing everything and making sure the games were on the square, when in fact, he was the guy that went off the rails. Ron Harris is keen to make his first attack on Vegas' digital slot machines. He wants to see if his scheme has worked. Harris uses the records of gaming control board agents to locate one of the slots he knows to be gaffed. Uh, he was able to find out where that machine was, what casino it was in, and exactly where it stood inside the casino floor. Harris takes his place at the rig slot machine. It's a dangerous move. As an agent of the gaming control board, he's prohibited from playing the slots. Anyone who works at the board is really not allowed to uh, play in any casino. It's a conflict of interest, really. It's part of our uh, contract when we sign on with the board. I didn't want to be seen there playing a machine. It wouldn't have looked right. But Harris is willing to take the risk. He has programmed the slot machine to release its payload only after receiving a specific sequence of coins. I played it. I went through the sequence. Three, and then one, and then two, and then three, and four. For a long series of coins. Two. The exact sequence of coins triggers a, a jackpot at a certain point. The rig computer chip recognizes Harris' sequence and immediately adds 200 credits to the slot machine's credit counter. A quick $200. Did that as a way so you didn't have to play 200 games and you didn't have to put in $200 to see if it had actually worked. The credit sudden jump means Ron has successfully gaffed the machine. I was really shocked, but... I knew that it had actually worked and had gone into the machine. Harris realizes he faces a huge dilemma. 
Big payouts at the slots attract attention, and Harris can't risk being caught. I then wanted to just play the 200 credits off and get rid of them. I couldn't play them off. I'm sitting there playing and playing, and I was winning legitimately. And I kept trying to lose the money so I could walk away. Usually people have problems with machines because they're losing money, and here I'm having a problem with the machine because it keeps winning. And I'm trying to get away from it. I finally did manage to get out of there. He was proud of himself um, walking out of that casino. And it was like, oh, wow, it, it worked. It did it. Harris is just getting started. Before the year is out, he will cheat slot machines all over Nevada. He felt that he could continue to do it, continue to put something over on, on everyone. Ron basically turned the gaff machines into his own personal ATMs. But how long can Las Vegas' top digital superstar keep up this masquerade? Fall 1992. Ron Harris is set to cheat Vegas out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Harris is a trusted agent of Nevada's Gaming Control Board, an expert in computers dedicated to hunting down digital cheaters. He was one of the best employees that the Gaming Control Board ever had. But there's another Ron Harris that no one knows. This technical whiz has secretly programmed a dozen or more slot machines to hit the jackpot whenever he wants. I did it for my own benefit at one point, and that was where you crossed the line. So far, no one suspects his illegal exploits. But Harris still has a dilemma. As an agent of the gaming control board, he's not even supposed to gamble in the casinos. Most of the enforcement agents know him, and if they happen to be in a casino and see him playing, yeah, he would, he would definitely lose his job. He's going to have to find a surrogate who can play for him. Harris teams up with the one person he can trust, John O'Connor. We go way back. We'd been friends for just many, many years, most of our adult life. Best of friends, in fact, more like brothers. He was a, he's fiercely intelligent, and it was a pleasure to spend time with him. John's a good guy. He does his part, and you can trust him. He'll always follow through. He'll always do what he says he will. When Ron Harris proposes that O'Connor join him in cheating the casinos, O'Connor can't believe it. Initially, I thought he was kidding. And uh, I kind of laughed, and, and, uh, and uh, he told me about it a little bit more. But, you know, within, within about four or five minutes of our conversation, I realized he really wasn't kidding. The two agreed to work together against the casinos. Kind of partners in crime. They became a cheating team. For goodness sake, in Las Vegas, everything's geared purposely towards casinos winning, so why not gear it the other way just a little bit? Reno, Nevada, John O'Connor walks onto the casino floor under the watchful eye of his friend, Ron Harris. The gaming control board star detective keeps a low profile. Once he confirms that I have the right machine, he would stand back. One by one, O'Connor feeds the coins into the slot machine. Three, he knew the sequence of coins and he knew how it was done, so he would just three, do it. One. It's like a code. Two coins, one coin, three coins, so on. And I memorized it. When that entire cycle is done, the machine's told then to hit a jackpot. And I played the last bet. I pressed the button. The reels word and word, and then bang, 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 three in a row. It's overwhelming. 
Harris and O'Connor have just held the casino up for $9,000 without anyone suspecting they've been robbed. It is nice, isn't it? For the next three years, Harris and O'Connor will steal thousands of dollars from the Nevada slots. This is working out. Between 1992 and 1995, Ron Harris pulled off the greatest cheating escapade in the history of Nevada. You walk out of the casino $10,000 richer. Simple and straightforward. Total jackpots all added up and everything together. I figure it was probably about $50,000. Jackpot after jackpot. No one suspects Ron Harris. He was able to pull the wool over the eyes of the not only the gaming control board, but the entire casino industry. Ron did not live above his means. Um, we, we all uh, you know, parked in the same parking lot. We saw you know, what, what car everybody drove. Even though no one is onto him yet, Ron Harris has reason to worry. He is leaving an electronic trail every time he corrupts a slot machine. If someone discovers the corrupted code inside the slots that Harris has rigged, they could possibly trace it back to him. Harris needs a better method to cheat the casinos, one that leaves no clues behind. He wanted to change his strategy and do something a little less uh, likely to end, put him in jail. Obviously, the way to do it would be to do it without tampering with the machine because then you don't really leave any evidence that you've done anything. One game will allow him to do this. Kino. Legend has it that a Chinese warlord first used an ancient version of Kino to finance the building of the Great Wall in 200 BC. Known as the Chinese Lottery, when it was brought to American shores by immigrants, the game was adapted by casinos and renamed Kino because private lottery games were illegal. In some ways, Kino resembles Lotto. You choose numbers on a, on a Kino uh, ticket and you try to uh, match those numbers when they're, when they're drawn. Players select numbers on a card, turn it in, and wait to see if the electronic board chooses the ones they predicted. Players can decide how many numbers to choose and how much they'll bet each turn. A typical player chooses eight numbers and bets a dollar a turn. Any winning ticket, certainly if you pick eight out of eight, that, that wins a very big award. The odds of that happening are slim. To win eight spots, to get the eight numbers that you chose, is tens of thousands to one. It almost never is achieved by anyone. Ron Harris wants to beat those odds and win the Kino jackpot. If you could make um, large amounts of money off it, that'd be great, yeah. In his job at the Gaming Control Board, Ron Harris has unlimited access to a Kino program called Imagineering. By closely studying the software, Harris tries to devise a program to crack the game. But how? How can a player, even a brilliant one like Ron, actually predict the digital game's outcome? The answer lies deep in the computer code that controls the Kino game's choice of numbers. The random number generator. The random number generator should be unbreakable, even if someone has a copy of the source code. No one should be able, at any given point in time, to be able to predict what the outcome is, is going to be. Harris works late into the night, obsessing over the computer code that produces the numbers in Kino. Finally, he figures out that the random number generator isn't really random. It's a sophisticated mathematical formula. Harris deciphers the formula. He could crunch the numbers, put them inside the computer, and then make some kind of prediction on uh, what the numbers would be in subsequent games. Is that cheating? If you can use your wits to be as smart as the machine you're betting against? Is it cheating if you can build a machine to outthink another machine? Once again, Ron Harris recruits John O'Connor to play for him. Ron told me about the bigger fish to be had in Kino. This Kino machine had just opened in Atlantic City, and Ron figured, Let, let's give this a try. Together, the two will raise the stakes and attempt the biggest gambling scam of their lives for the ultimate prize, the $100,000 Kino jackpot. 
January 1995, Ron Harris and John O'Connor are headed to Atlantic City for their most ambitious casino scam yet, a run for the Kino jackpot. This was like a $100,000 jackpot, so I was actually doing this for money. Harris is a sworn agent of the Nevada Gaming Control Board. He's supposed to be busting computer scams in casinos. Instead, Harris has designed a program of his own, a program that can predict winning numbers on a Kino game. He saw an opportunity to take advantage of it and cheat it. Harris and O'Connor have only a few hours to get ready for the biggest challenge of their lives, to match wits against a fully functioning casino filled with cameras, guards, and gaming agents. The adventure in New Jersey was my ultimate gamble. At 6 p.m., John O'Connor arrives in Atlantic City from the Cayman Islands. Checking in. Welcome to Atlantic City. All the way from the Cayman Islands, sir? Yeah. I considered what it would be like to be found out. And I was always looking over my shoulder. Have there been any messages for me? Ron was supposed to have met me there. He was late. His airplane was late getting in. No, sir, I'm sorry. We just had a multitude of problems, had uh, uh, airplanes delayed, schedules messed up, I missed a connecting flight. H-A-R-R-I-S. No problem. I left them information to give Ron a key and let him know which room I was staying in. Ended up being something like two or three in the morning when I finally got there. What took you, man? Don't ask. It started out very, very bad. It was very rough. I was like, man, this better be worth it, <laughs> you know? The following morning, the two men gear up in their hotel room. Ron Harris will stay put. He can follow the casino's Kino results on the television in his room and input the numbers into his computer. Hotels allow you to play Kino up in your room. Harris will use a radio to communicate with John O'Connor, who'll go to the casino. We decided on a two-meter radio, small, small as a pack of cigarettes, and then a very small earpiece in fact, it was an altered hearing aid. Very James Bondish. I could talk to him on a radio. He couldn't talk back. He could only hear me. Okay, John, here we go. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25. Hey. Four thirty p.m. John O'Connor arrives in the Kino pit. I walked into the casino lounge, picked up a few tickets for Kino, and waited for Ron's call with the numbers. I was very nervous about it. i never done anything like that before. Showtime. Okay, John. Help to God you can hear me. Take your position. Our first round is in five minutes. The numbers would come up on the TV screen from the Kino game. I'd enter them in the computer, and then it would flash up what numbers would be best to bet for the next game. Okay, first round, here we go. Two. Harris recites the numbers so that O'Connor can hear them through a secret earpiece. 31, 37. O'Connor fills in the numbers on his Kino card. 69. Mm -hmm. So I wrote down the first series of numbers that the computer said we should play. Game 513. I watched as the tickets came up. 12. Nope, this one's not a hit. That one's not a hit. 53. Okay, only two matches. Don't freak out. I'm on it. I'm getting it. Okay. okay. Stay loose. Stay loose. You can get closer. I'd just wait for the next game to come up. And then when that came up, I would enter the numbers again. It would give me the picks to pick. I would radio those down to him. All right, here we go. Four, four, 12, 
12, 22, 36, 46, 53, 57, 71. 71. Game 5, 15. 71. 57. 36. 22. 46. 53. 12. Come on, baby. Come on. Four. Oh, that's it, baby. Yeah. That's it, baby. Yeah. Just by, by sheer luck, good luck or bad luck, everything went just kind of how I'd hoped it would go. <laughs> But as any veteran casino cheat will tell you, winning is only the first step. Collecting the bet can be even tougher. The plan so far has gone off like clockwork, but no one planned an exit strategy. It made them suspicious immediately that somebody had won a $100,000 jackpot. Literally, right away, the guy looked at me and said, I've never seen this before. All right, I don't know, I think I gotta win it, huh? Match. John O'Connor's win makes him nervous, and he starts to make mistakes. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. You know something? Never even played Keno before. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna need to see some ID, please. He shows a different ID than the one he used to check into the hotel. I hand it to the lady. Be right back. Okay. And she went off to confirm, and she took an extremely long time to return. The longer she took, the more nervous I got. When she came back, she asked, well, how would you like that? Cash. That might take her a little while. OK, um, no problem. I said, well, I am staying at the hotel. And you can call me in the hotel room when you're ready. So I went upstairs. I need to speak to a manager. Rum was visibly shaken. Where's the money? That was a problem. You gotta check some things out. Problem? He was really keyed up. What problem? For the first time, one of Ron Harris's cheating schemes has failed to produce an immediate payoff. Ron Harris's charade is about to be discovered. Ron Harris, the computer specialist for the Nevada Gaming Control Board, has just used his computer to predict the winning numbers in a game of Kino. But casino security is on to him, and he may not get away with it. His accomplice, John O'Connor, has made a crucial mistake. At the hotel, he registered as a resident of the Cayman Islands, but the ID he gave the floor manager is his Nevada driver's license. It starts raising suspicions, and they uh, called the police, and the police came in, and they uh, looked at the registration records for the hotel and they found that Ron had also registered with this individual. When the casino's head of security hears the name Ron Harris, the alarms start to ring. That uh, person said, well, wait a minute, somebody named Ron Harris analyzed this program for the Gaming Control Board. And that's what really got the police into action. In the hotel room, Ron Harris is seriously worried. What's taking them so long? What do you think they're up to? See, it's probably the money now. It's about time. John O'Connor? Um, no, no, I'm a friend of his. I'm John O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor, would you please come downstairs with us to our office, sir? And they said that they just wanted to talk with them. They had some questions. I didn't have a choice. I went with them. 
I didn't do anything wrong. Came here to have some laughs with my buddy Ron. That's all you have casinos, huh? For laughs? I gotta tell you, Mr. O'Connor. I don't think you're being totally straight with us. Don't tell me you walk in here. You hit the jackpot on the very first time. Are you kidding? What does timing have to do with chins? I mean, it hits what it hits for. I mean, ain't that right? Are you telling me that you know when the jackpots are coming? You did absolutely nothing wrong. Nothing. I'll tell you, Mr. Connor. I just don't believe you, so you wouldn't mind if maybe we check your hotel room? Mr. Harris? Mr. Harris? Mr. Harris, open up, Mr. Harris. I took the computers and left the room with them. I just went and got on the flight and flew back to Las Vegas. The only traces of Ron Harris left in the room are a few computer disks. In a way, there was sort of a relief. Well, whatever is done is done. It's over. I don't have to do this anymore. I won't do this anymore. As Harris flees for Nevada, a call goes out from Atlantic City to Las Vegas. People I knew from the gaming board in Las Vegas arrested me. They were just waiting there for me. This is unprecedented. This was the biggest scandal that the uh, Nevada gaming regulators had ever witnessed. All the authorities in Las Vegas have are questions. What about the thousands of slot machines that were supposed to be under Harris's protection? Have they been compromised? He had actually stole the source code that every manufacturer had submitted for all of their gaming devices. By October 1995, Harris's colleagues have located the infected slots. It took them months to unravel the fact that he had been cheating at gamings in Nevada for three years. In June 1996, a grand jury indicts Harris for several illegal slot jackpots. In February 1997, Ron Harris is placed in the Las Vegas Black Book, barring him from entering any Las Vegas casino ever again. Eleven months later, Harris is sentenced to seven years in prison. That was uh, considered to be the stiffest sentence ever given to somebody on a, on a first offense uh, cheating at gaming charge. When I heard Ron was going to prison, it was like a brother going to prison. I lost a good two years of my life in prison. I felt like I betrayed him in a way. I wouldn't spend another year in prison for a million dollars. I mean, it's just, it's not worth it. And turn. John O'Connor does not serve time but receives a felony conviction for helping Harris cheat the slots. I was never angry at Ron for offering me this adventure. Uh, he didn't make the decision, I made the decision. Ron Harris used his insider status to double cross the system. He worked for the very agency whose charter it is to protect the public and the casinos from cheating. Harris came as close as anyone to breaking Vegas. Uh, Ron Harris is probably the most notorious cheat in the history of Nevada. Ron risked everything to see if he could do it. What made me so good at the job is what got me in trouble, too. He almost got away with it. 